The theosophical Kabbalah of the Hebrews is an incredible system. There are many levels of interpretation and the subject is rather deep. Many educated humans devote their entire life to studying the Kabbalah and as a system it's huge and extremely complex, certainly worthy of a life's work. Now I'm relatively new to the subject so I'm not going to delve too deeply as I simply could not begin to do it justice. I will ever, however attempt to the best of my ability to give a very brief introduction to the symbolism and then go on to show how the dimensions of reality can be shown as a fundamental part of this system. It's the numbers 1, 3, 10 and 11 that I really want to focus on today and I'm going to focus on those numbers by borrowing something from the Kabbalah and I'm going to call it a naked tree of life. Superstring theory with its 10 dimensions and that's made up of 9 spatial dimensions and one of time is in essence a scientific attempt to explain the reality all around us. It's one of the leading physics models and it attempts to explain the inner workings of the universe. M theory is a little bit different and it states that there are 11 dimensions made up of 10 spatial and 1 temporal. So which is correct? Superstring with its 10 dimensions or M theory with its 11? Consider for a moment that both are indeed correct and there are 10 and 11 dimensions simultaneously. Speaking of the uh, Kabbalah, a millennia before modern science, a work known as the Zohar may have been aware of 10 or 11 dimensions that make up our universe. And it seems that as with a vast array of subjects, science has only just caught up with a concept possibly known to our distant ancestors and very well concealed. I'm sure for many good reasons. Now before I go any further I need to touch a little bit on something called the language of symbolism. I need to do this because it will unite with the later part of this um, lecture and hopefully bring some clarity at the end. Your inner self does not speak English, German or Mandarin and neither does the universe. There's a language that only the wisest people throughout the ages can speak. The phrase, a picture paints a thousand words, should be taken literally when considering the language of symbolism. The following images may appear very different to the uninitiated, but to an initiated person, they are certainly expressing very similar things. Before I put forward a hypothesis that marries what I'm calling the naked tree of life with spatial and temporal dimensions, I'll first dive in and give you a very brief overview of a populated uh, tree of life. So if, uh, if you look at this image, you'll see that it's made up of three distinct parts. On the left, there are three nodes that make the left pillar. In the center, you will see four and a shadowy fifth node, which makes up the middle pillar. And the right hand side, you will see three more nodes that make up the right hand pillar. Now, as far as symbolism goes, we can um, explain the left pillar. It's the pillar of structure. It represents the feminine, the female, the divine Isis. It represents Mother Earth. It represents so below. It's the black pillar. It's the left-hand pillar at the portrayal entrance to the Temple of You. It's the pillar of severity and strength. So those three nodes, you can see how you can get a lot of information, if you know a little bit about it, just from um, the looking at, at the symbolism from one side. The right-hand pillar is known as the pillar of the dynamic. That represents the masculine or male. It's the divine Osiris. It represents the heavens as above. It's the white pillar. It's the right-hand pillar at the portrait of the entrance to the Temple of You. It's the pillar of mercy. Now the middle pillar, which is made up of four clear nodes and one shadowy fifth node, is the pillar of consciousness. It's your consciousness standing in the centre of both the female and male aspects of you. Because we all have male and female aspects within all of us. And in the centre of the centre, in the centre of you, is something called the monad and it's labelled Tiferet here and if you look into the middle node where we're zooming now you will see a circle with a dot right in the centre of it. This is known as the monad, it represents God, the unity of the divine being and this is a fundamental part of this lecture which will tie in right at the end. So I mentioned three pillars there, let's talk about the two outer pillars, the left hand pillar and the right hand pillar. 
Now the left hand pillar, as I mentioned, referred to many things, but it primarily refers to Mother Earth. And in architecture and Freemasonry, it can be shown with the terrestrial globe on the top of it. The right hand pillar, the other one, that represents the heavens and is shown in Freemasonry with a celestial globe on top of it. This leads to the hermetic principle of correspondence, which is as above, so below. And that's why all of these pictures are shown with the right hand pointing up as above and the left hand pointing down, so below. All different pictures saying pretty much the same thing in the language of symbolism. As for architecture, the next time you walk through two pillars into a grand building, perhaps you'll remember that that building is now talking to you intentionally. It's saying, as above, so below. Okay, so let's have a look at the Baphomet image of Alphaeus Levy and dive a little deeper into symbolism. Now we've already expressed how the pointing of the hands is the hermetic principle of correspondence, as above, so below. We've also expressed that when you're walking into a random grand building, the architect of that building is saying to you, as above, so below, by the two pillars on the way in. But there are other aspects of this image that are also saying the same thing over and over again. So we look and we see that the image has got breasts and a phallus. So the image has got male and female qualities. The breasts representing the left hand pillar, the female, and the phallus representing the right hand pillar or the male. At the top of the image, you'll see two horns um, and, a, and a central shaft. So this is another trinity. And um, the two horns represent again the left and the right hand pillar and the central shaft with the flame above it is the flame of intelligence. That's the magic light of universal balance. That's the middle pillar. That's you in the center of the universe of you. So when you stand between two pillars, you complete the trinity and unite the universal balance of male and female. Standing between those two pillars forms the divine being, the tree of life. Hey, I'm sure there are many butch masculine men out there who are going to be horrified to learn that they are half female. But it's a human fact. Men are male on the outside and female on the inside and vice versa. And this is understood by another way of saying the hermetic principle of correspondence. We don't just say as above, so below. We can also say as within, so without. Okay, so where am I going with all this talk of symbolism? Well, I'm going to show you something now that will arc through the rest of the lecture and hopefully bring it all together. This is the symbolic way to write the number 10. It consists of the monad, which is a circle with a dot, which represents God, the unity of the divine being, and also an empty circle representing the chaos from which all things were created. These two shapes together form 10. And 10 is a number that you should hold as a thought for the rest of this lecture. I'd also like to, you to hold the image of a monad while remembering that it represents the unity of the divine being. The monad, or the circle with the dot in it, represents the unity of all things. The intersection of all. Okay, so speculation. Now I'm not saying that everything that I'm about to tell you is technically correct. Um, but it's a hypothesis that I feel is really worth sharing, so I'll let you be the judge of it. The world as we know it has three dimensions of space, that is to say, length, width and depth, and one dimension of time. We only perceive these four dimensions, up, down, left, right, forward, back and time. And they are known collectively to us as space-time. That's all we perceive. All we know, but crucially, those four dimensions are not all. We do not see the full picture of the real world around us. So if there are other dimensions, where are they and how many are there? Now I mentioned earlier that superstring theory states that there are 10 dimensions and M theory states that there are a total of 11. But which is correct? Well, consider that they both are. And I'll explain the quantum reason for that shortly. It also begs the question, of course, where are the higher six or seven dimensions and what are their nature? Why can't we see them? I'll explain that too. I also mentioned a moment ago that we live in four dimensions of space-time and that's all we know and all we can perceive. But I'll also prove to you that that's not true either. And I'll explain how you can feel and sense the 10th dimension given a total of five dimensions 
in what I'm going to call our sphere of influence. If you look at this image, you'll see what I'm calling a naked tree of life. It's made up of three large circles, the lower green, spatial dimensions, the centre blue, temporal dimensions, and the yellow one at the top, spiritual dimensions. There are also 10 smaller colour-coded circles or nodes and a shadowy 11th. Let's start by looking at the large green circle at the bottom. This is the sphere of influence that we humans perceive day to day. Whatever is inside that large green circle is our conscious reality. Inside it you will see three smaller green circles, one representing height, one breadth and one depth. The smaller green circles are the three spatial dimensions in which we live. Inside that large green circle you'll also notice a small blue circle and a black one with a dot in it. Now ignore the monad for a moment, we'll come on to that shortly. Take a look at the small blue circle inside the large green circle. That's the first temporal dimension and it's inside our human sphere of influence. So we should be able to sense it and we can. That's our interpretation of time. It's the monodirectional single dimension of time in which we move forward at a rate of one second per second. Clocks measure this dimension of time for us, whereby we use a ruler to measure the former three spatial dimensions. Now let's take a look at the large blue circle. This represents the temporal dimensions. Inside the large blue circle you will see three smaller blue circles, one for each of the three temporal dimensions. We've already mentioned the lower blue circle, which is the monodirectional time that we can sense. So what are the other two? One of them represents two-directional time. If you could experience this dimension, you could travel freely forwards and backwards in time. We can't do that as humans because it's not within our sphere of influence. The third small green circle represents alternate realities, different versions of realities. One where you were not born or one where you were born with ginger hair. We humans, again, can't experience alternate realities as this little blue circle is not within our green sphere of influence. Also, in the large blue temporal sphere is the aforementioned monad. Again, ignore that for now as its purpose will become clear. The final small circle inside the blue sphere is a small grey circle. Now what if I told you that that was not really there and that it was actually one thing in two places at once or two things in one place? What if I told you that the act of observing that sphere determined where it chose to be? It's the node that is interchangeable with all of the other nodes and it represents knowledge, but it's not really there, but it is. This grey node is a quantum duality. It's Schrodinger's cat. It's Einstein's spooky action at a distance. It's an expression of the quantum world. But for the sake of quantum sanity that I'm not getting into today, let's ignore that grey sphere for a moment and imagine that it's not there. But it is. Let's look uh, now at the large yellow circle at the top. Now within the large yellow circle, which I've called the spiritual dimensions, you will see three smaller yellow circles. You'll also notice within the larger yellow sphere of influence there are two blue temporal dimensions and again the monad. Now I'll ask you to ignore the monad one final time because after this lecture you will likely never ignore it again. To explain the nature of the yellow spiritual dimensions is literally beyond rational comprehension but I'll give it a try. Let's suppose for a moment that the yellow spiritual dimensions represented by the three smaller yellow spheres are similar in nature to the green spatial dimensions in which we live, except the beings that lived within the yellow sphere of influence within that circle, they would have access to two blue temporal dimensions and would be unaffected by the annoying forward only time that we sense day to day. Those spiritual beings could move freely in time forward and back, and experience at will alternate dimensions as easily as we look at a clock. This would literally give them the power of God compared to us stuck in the lower dimensional cage. Okay, just to summarise where we are at the moment. So at the beginning I mentioned superstring theory states that there are 10 dimensions and M theory 11. 
So far we've identified three green spatial dimensions, three blue temporal dimensions, three yellow spiritual dimensions, and one quantum grey that's not really there, but it is. That's maybe the 11th dimension that M theory is talking about. And then there's the 10th dimension, which is the monad. Making a total of 10 or 11 dimensions if we double count the grey quantum 11th. Okay, it's time to talk about the monad. The monad is the 10th dimension. It's the convergence point of all dimensions. It's in the center of the Kabbalah and crucially for us humans, it's within our sphere of influence. It's within all three sphere of influences. And if that's the case, where is it? Why can't we see or sense it like we can the other four dimensions of space-time? Where is the monad? Well, perhaps we can sense the monad, and perhaps it's more obvious than you would believe. But before I tell you where to find it, I'd like to quote the late great Manly P. Hall. The pineal gland is a link between the consciousness of man and the invisible worlds of nature. Whenever the arc of the pituitary body contacts this gland, there are flashes of temporary clairvoyance. But the process of making these two work together consistently is one requiring not only years, but lives of consecration and special physiological and biological training. This third eye is the cyclopean eye of the ancients, for it was an organ of conscious vision long before the physical eyes were formed although vision was a sense of cognition rather than sight in those ancient times. A practical experiment. Time to find the monad. At midday, turn south and close your eyes. Put your arms out to your sides and look slightly up. Feel the love and warmth of the sun on your face and this feeling is the monad. It's in the center of our solar system. It's in the center of your brain. It's in the center of the Kabbalah. The monad is the convergence. It is in the center of all things. And it is beauty and it is glory. Thanks for taking the time to watch the video today. I uh, hope you found it interesting. And if you know anyone else out there who might find it interesting, please do feel free to share it with them. I'd also appreciate it if you would like and subscribe the video because that would certainly help me going forward. I'm Steve and this has been Bright Weird.